Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending Lobster Conference. As you may have noticed, I am not physically present. We had a family emergency up in Washington, and so I am there supporting my family. Um, but I extend my love to you. I'm so happy for everyone who showed up and for everyone who helped. I want to personally thank um, Milton McLeland and Dina and um, Sean and all the people that made the Lobster Conference possible this year. Um, of course, I couldn't have done it without you guys. Um, and of course, I want to thank all the speakers today. So, because we're not, because we're short on time, I want to just jump right into it. So today, I want to talk about altered states of consciousness, and I want to talk about Joseph Smith and his first vision. Now, um, if you attended the last lobster conference, you'll notice that I talked about this uh, previously, and you need to understand why I care about this so deeply. So I'm going to use the whiteboard to demonstrate why I care about altered states of consciousness so much. At the last lobster conference, I presented what's called the nine dot problem. You have nine dots and the goal here is to use four lines to connect these nine dots. Now the rules of the game are you cannot lift up your pen. Um, each dot it must be continuous to the last. So, you know, once you end the line, you start a new line. You can't lift up your pen, and you have to connect all nine dots. Now, what happens, I'll use a red marker, because people usually fail this um, test um, almost always. And what happens is this. They'll, they'll say, okay, uh, you know, one line, two lines, three lines, four lines. Oh, shoot. I ran out of lines. I, don't, I can't connect the last dot. Or they'll do, you know, one dot, two dots, three dots. Four, or your four lines, my, my mistake. And you have two dots that haven't been touched at all. And they get frustrated with this problem because it looks easy and it is easy, but for some reason they can't crack it. And the reason why they can't crack it is because when you look at the nine dots, your mind you know, absorbs the information and it instantly creates a frame in which all that information is relevant and makes sense. And so what people do is they, you know, they have a narrow-minded sort of, model of the problem in their mind. And in order to solve this problem, you have to think outside the box. That's actually where the phrase comes from, is from this problem where you think outside the box. Now, if you tell people, hey, I need you to think outside the box on this, it doesn't help them think outside the box. Um, but it's still true. So what we mean by in, uh, think outside the box is you have to break the frame and you have to expand the frame and you have to create a new frame that not only covers this information, but also includes other information that you have overlooked. Um, and so in order to solve this problem, what you have to do is you have to do this. You go like this, and you go like this, then you go like this, then you go like this. Solve. But yeah, that's how you do it. So that will make it into the recording. Anyway. So that's how you solve that problem. You, like I said, you have to think outside the box. It's kind of hard to do. Even I forgot how to do it. Um, but once, once uh, you solve it, it's like, oh, it's obvious. And also you're like, oh, but you didn't tell me I could, you know, travel further than the dots implied that you could travel. So why is this important to me? Well, what happens is we have all sorts of problems that we're facing uh, in life. So. We have all sorts of problems that you have to solve in life, and most of them are tricky. They're not, you know, they seem like the, you could solve them, but there's something about them that you can't solve. And so um, we have to think outside the box in order to uh, solve these problems. Now, like I said, it's very difficult to think outside the box. It's very hard to just stare at this and then, and then reconfigure your way of thinking. But... Uh, psychologists um, like John Verveke would argue that religion in particular has developed techniques to alter your state of consciousness. Why, why does it matter that you alter your state of consciousness? Well, altering your state of consciousness helps you see what you normally don't see. For example, um, even animals will do this. Ravens will tumble down roofs in order to make themselves dizzy. And they do this so that they can kind of uh, have an edge uh, on their uh, on their 
um, scavenging practices. Um, you know, when it comes to religion, ancient shaman would do this. They would change their states of consciousness by engaging things like uh, incessant drumming or chanting, or they would deprive themselves of sleep, or they would pretend to be an animal and they would kind of like act it out. Or what they would do, they would do things like um, deprive themselves of sex or engage in a lot of sex so that their um, that, so that their state of consciousness would be altered. And once your state of consciousness is altered, you know, you start to see things a little differently. You know, like, for example, you could blur your eyes and you might see something that you normally wouldn't see, or you might perceive something that you normally wouldn't perceive. And so these, um, these techniques that alter your state of consciousness are meant to give you an insight. So John Verbeke, um, and his colleagues would argue that, you know, your state of consciousness exists among a continuum. And so you have different parts of, uh, you have different states of consciousness. For example, you could be dreaming, right? You're asleep. You're not really conscious, but you're kind of conscious, right? For example, um, you're somewhat aware of your environment, but not too aware. And while you're in the dream state, um, maybe you're not aware that you're dreaming, but sometimes you are. And even still within the dream, you're like, this seems weird. This doesn't seem like everyday life. And then you wake up and you're like, oh, that was just a dream, especially if it was a terrifying dream. That was just a dream, right? Now, sometimes our dreams can have meaning. Um, and Jordan Peterson would argue that your dream, you know, are meant to present you with a problem. And while you're not dream state, you can sort of look at the problem a little differently than when you were awake. But um, it doesn't necessarily tell you how to solve the problem, but it, but it sort of gives you a new perspective on that problem, or at least a, one that you're not familiar with. So what's the problem with dreaming? The problem is that sometimes you fall into, you fall prey to self-deception. You say, I had a dream and now I know that I need to marry this person. So then you date them and then it doesn't work out and you're devastated. And uh, maybe even to the point of losing your faith. And so, like I said earlier, the things that make you adaptive can also lead you to engage in self-deception. Um, and they make you trip up. So back to the so back to the different states of consciousness. You wake up, you realize it was just a dream, it wasn't real. It was maybe maybe it was interesting, maybe it was meaningful, but it wasn't totally real. Um, it was just a dream. It was just in your mind. So then, you know, you can do other things to change your state of consciousness. For example, if you are um, helping a student learn, you can do what's called scaffolding. Scaffolding is when you present the student with um, a some type of material that's a little bit above what they already know, and so it's a challenge. It's not um, it's not so familiar that they're bored. And it's not so difficult that they're now anxious about the problem. It's just slightly more difficult than what they're normal or what they're used to. And, and then they, you know, in attempting to master the material, they have insight and they learn more quickly and they grasp the concepts. That's called scaffolding. Now, this can also be applied. Um, this, all, this mechanism of scaffolding can be ramped up and you can do uh, what's called entering the flow state. This happens a lot, especially for rock climbers. What they'll do is they'll, you know, they're, they're climbing the, the rock wall and it's risky. You can fall, you can hurt yourself, but it's also deeply engaging and a lot of fun. And maybe they get to a part of the, in the rock wall where it's not so obvious where they need to put their hands and their feet in order to get to the top. And so what they do is they, they're up there. They know that they can't stop or else they'll fall. And so they have to, um, you know, what happens is they, they look at the rock wall and then their brain reconfigures everything and, and uh, all of a sudden they know how to climb up the rock wall and so they take the risk in climbing up the rock wall and it works and they're at the top and it's the best feeling ever. Martial artists also do this when they're sparring. For example, um, when people are sparring, you know, it, it can be dangerous because you're engaging in combat with another human being, but also it's deeply fun, it's athletic, and if you really master the skill, it becomes almost like 
you know, it's that, it's that same feeling like when you're in the zone. You're not totally in control and it's sort of just flowing and it sort of just happens, but like you intuitively know what to do and it flows through you. And then the martial art that you, the two people are engaging in, not only is it um, sort of dangerous fun, but then it becomes like a dance um, where people are sparring and it looks cool and the aesthetics are cool and it's flowing and it's really awesome. Um, that's an example of engaging the flow state. And like I said earlier, athletes who are like in the zone, that's what they're doing there. They're in the zone and they're in that flow state. Now, John Verbeke would then argue that that mechanism can then be rounded up even further and you get into what's called like a mystical state or and you that's where you have ex, uh, spiritual experiences and where you can even receive some type of revelation. You know, you, you, you have a mystical experience. And then if you ramp that up even further, you enter what's called transformative states. Um, and these are the experiences that people like the Apostle Paul had or experiences like, the, you know, what uh, Alma the Younger had, where the, 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 the state that they were in was so, you know, um, awe-inspiring they're so mystical that they are now a changed person and what happens is when that as you'll notice in at each point of altered states your self-consciousness sort of fades away further and further and and so when you when you have these transformative experiences you undergo a radical change in self so you might be wondering now well what does this have to do with joseph smith and as I was reading Saints, I was reading um, Ruffs on Rolling, I noticed something um, in Joseph Smith's history. When Joseph Smith was a young boy, he was, he was lame, right? He had surgery on his leg and he had to be on crutches. And so what happened with him was he, ha you know, he knew all what, kind of what to do, how to help around his father's farm, but he was now on crutches and he had to relearn how to how to do all those things. And so within his lived experience, a type of scaffolding occurred and he had to relearn simple tasks that were now much more difficult because of his lameness, but nonetheless, he had to do them. And it was, there was obviously some type of risk. If you didn't help around the farm, you probably didn't eat or you probably didn't make money or, or you were met with punishment from your parents. And so you definitely had to do those things. Um, and so Joseph Smith, and not only that, but you don't feel good if you're just, if you're lame, you know, you want to be able-bodied. And so Joseph Smith was definitely pressured by his environment and by his family to, to master the everyday skills that he once knew. Now, while reading Son Rolling, um, as he was describing Joseph Smith's, you know, upbringing, his mom would describe him as a very meditative young man. And, uh, and that when he read the scriptures, he didn't just read, fly through them. He didn't read extensively, but he read very deeply. And, he, and when he read something, he read it very you know, profoundly. He really let the words sink into his heart. And, and he would go on to describe you know, his scripture reading as something that would penetrate his heart. So, um, there's something interesting about the word meditation. Meditation is a religious practice uh, where you center your awareness and you center it closer and closer to your body. Um, the word middle is contained within the word meditation. Um, Joseph Smith was very contemplative. Contemplation has the word temple in it. And the word temple comes from the word templum, which means a spot marked out to look out. And so Joseph Smith was doing this, you know, meditation, contemplation type thing. Uh, you know, where he would read deeply about things and he would um, and he would describe it as things entering into him, into his heart. But then at the same time, he was very contemplative and he thought a lot about what he had experienced. And so he was constantly shifting his awareness um, as he read the scriptures and um, investigated religion. Like I said earlier, religious practices um, are... Um, have developed these psychotechnologies that are meant to uh, change our states of consciousness. Meditation, prayer, singing, fasting, these types of things are meant to change our awareness. Uh, fasting is a great example where 
you know, you deprive yourself of food and water so that you can empathize with those who are without or with people who are suffering. And that gives you an insight into what people might be, might be feeling. And so imagine, you know, when, when someone is suffering on the street in Jerusalem and Jesus says, in order to heal, help this person, we need to pray and fast first. And that's a serious um, recommendation to, to really put yourself in the shoes of that person. So Joseph Smith is reading and he, he's praying, you know, non-verbally, but he, he, he's trying to have dialogue with, with, um, with God. And he, he comes to the conclusion, you know, after he reads James, an experience that he describes as one as entering his heart, he decides, okay, I need to go to the woods, to the grove and pray. And so then he kneels to pray. And this is the first time he prays vocally. And can, and you can imagine um, do you, I don't know if any of you remember the first time you prayed vocally or felt confidently about praying vocally, but it's, yeah. uh, it's an experience that definitely changes your awareness. It brings solemnity to the environment in which you're in. So once Joseph Smith engages in that, another psychotechnology prayer, he has this transformative experience. And um, in this transformative experience, he he has what's called the first vision and he, he, he learns, you know, earth shattering truths. Now, before I get into the first vision further, I want to share a video by John Vermeke. So we will watch that first. So that was the problem we had set up, the problem of higher states of consciousness. Now I want to start by talking about what it's like uh, to give a theory. We talked about this also last time. We want a theory that's both descriptively adequate and prescriptively adequate. A descriptive theory should tell me, like, give me a good explanation for why these higher states of consciousness have the experiential feel that they have, why they, and why they're able to produce these deep kinds of transformations. Because if you remember, what typically happens is because people have sensed this deep connectedness to reality, and because being connected to reality is one of fundamental ways in which we make our lives meaningful, people will radically transform their whole lives, their sense of self, their interpersonal relationship, in order to maintain and enhance that connectedness to this deepened reality. So we need to explain, give a descriptively adequate explanation. And this has to work at multiple levels. And this is where cognitive science is so important. Uh, because of the way it tries to bridge between these various levels and disciplines. We need to give an account of the psychological processes, of the information processes, and ultimately uh, the brain processes that are at work. Then we need a prescriptively adequate theory of higher states of consciousness. We need an account that explains why it might be considered rationally justifiable that these states authorize and legitimate such transformations. Can we see why these states should be listened to when they claim to give us access to a deeper reality? Now, in order to carry out the first one, seeing what the Siddhartha was going through, right, when he's achieving this higher state of consciousness, this awakened state, and if you remember last time we talked about how how comprehensively extended this is, not only qualitatively through the world religions, but just quantitatively through the population. The 30 to 40 percent of people uh, report these awakening experiences and the resulting deep transformation. So in order to get through that, let's talk about what, what does it feel like to be in such a state. And because we have these surveys and we have the work of Newberg and Taylor, and we have lots of first-person accounts, we can draw some general pictures of what's going on. So there's three components we want to look at. We want to look at how is the world being experienced, how is the self being experienced, and how is the relationship between the world and the self being experienced. So let's start on the world side. So people report the following things. They report um, a tremendous sense of clarity. And this is both perceptual and cognitive. So the world seems extremely clear to them and makes sense to them in a way that it hasn't before. 
The perceptual part of that clarity is often, ex uh, often experienced as bright. Things are shining. Um, and that's the original meaning of glory, for example. Uh, uh, to go back to the Bible, for example, the term that is most often used to describe God is glory, which is not a moral term. It's a term about how sort of shining um, God is, how, how bright it is. Now, you remember, uh, that's a feature that people also reliably report in the flow experience, that everything seems very vivid and in bright um, and intense. Now, what's interesting is that while people describe this clarity, and notice how this is going to pick up on what we talked about when we talked about mindfulness. They talk about both an expansion of vision, so it's very comprehensive. They get almost like they're somehow aware of the whole of the world, but they also are aware of finite details. So this is captured, for example, in Blake's famous poem, right? To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and to spend eternity in an hour. So you get this deep interpenetration of sort of everything and the finite details. And you can see that. So what you're getting is this massive expansion of that attentional scaling that we talked about mindfulness enhancing and thereby enhancing our capacity to break frame and make frame and get fundamental insight. And pay attention to the word insight. Seeing into reality. So. Overall, there's an increased sense of making sense of things, right? Making sense of things. So the world is both intricate and interesting in this extended and enhanced and shining way. So almost universally, people describe this experience as the world is beautiful. It's deeply beautiful to them. And we'll come back at some point to talk about the connections between beauty and truth. Uh, particularly the work of Scari about this. The world is very alive. It seems very alive during these experiences because it's so pregnant with energy and significance. And all of this, all of this comprehensiveness, but intricate detail, the shining, the beauty, the making sense, all of this comes together in the notion of oneness. There is somehow an underlying oneness to everything. There's deep and profound integration, which of course makes sense given that very often when we are explaining something, we are finding what unifies and integrates them together. What's happening on the side of the self? What's happening on the side of the self is people report a profound sense of peace. And this is not peace in an empty, just lack of conflict. It's very similar to what we talked about in Plato. And you're probably seeing Plato's ideas about anagage resonating with this. I hope you're seeing that. But remember in Plato, right, that inner state of peace is one of inner harmony. When all of the various components of your personality and your cognition are mutually, optimally working together in concert. And this is the kind, what people report. They often report that this is the greatest sense of peace they've ever experienced in their life. And if you remember in Plato, this sense of peace, right, is connected to and resonates with this enhanced sense of connectedness to reality. And interestingly enough, that's what we're seeing in these um, and these descriptions. People also describe uh, experiencing profound joy. Now, of course, we've lost the sense of what this word means. Uh, we've lost it pr precisely in words like enjoyment, where enjoyment means having fun or pleasure. But joy is not the experience of fun or pleasure. Joy is the positive emotion you have when you experience a deep connection to what is good. So joy is the experience you have of this is really, really good. Okay. Interestingly, people often report a fundamental change in their sense of self. And we're going to come back to this. They report two things. They'll often report that their normal sense of self has disappeared. Their egocentric, autobiographical sense of self has disappeared. And if you remember, that's 
That's continuous with what we saw when people are in the flow state. They report that self-consciousness, that autobiographical narrative self is disappearing. They often also report remembering in the sense we talked about when we talked about sati and remembering the being mode. They remember, they say, I remember my true self. I remember who I really am. So there's a profound connection inward to the core machinery of the self that is at one with a profound sense of connecting to the underlying pattern that governs and makes intelligible reality. People report that in this state they have a tremendous uh, sense of energy and vitality, again analogous to the flow state. And finally, they report that they're going, they often use this term, there's a tremendous sense of insight and understanding. Again, uh, continuous with the flow state. Now what about the relation? So this is deep connection, profound connectedness, deep at one again like the flow state, but even more, people feel so at one that they start to feel that they're participating in their reality that they're connected to. They start to feel like they're sharing identity to it. And this you know, way of thinking about this is when we talked about Aristotle's notion of the conformity theory of knowing. They, they feel so deeply conformed to this underlying reality from the very core of their being that they are experiencing an identification with it. But this participatory knowing is so superlative and it's so profound and so transformative that inevitably people just say that the experience, that this connection is ineffable. And we, we noted this the last time we were talking about. How is it that these experiences that have no right, articulable declarative content, because they're ineffable, you can't put them into words, you can't put them into propositional thought, nevertheless are considered so, so loaded with, so capable of bearing the signature of ultimate reality or realness for people. So we need a descriptive theory that can account for all of these features, the features of how the world is experienced, how the self is experienced, and the relation. Now, what I've been showing you already, of course, is deep continuity with the flow experience. I'm not claiming it's a flow experience, it's more than that, but I'm showing you that there's continuity, just like I showed you that there's continuity between the flow experience and the insight experience. And that's why when people are having these higher states of consciousness, they are also uh, proposing a, a, a very profound insight. And notice how often when you have an insight, it's also ineffable to you. You don't know how the insight arose or what comes, how it came to be. you just like, ah, I just see it. So John Ravecki describes the features of altered states of consciousness, specifically transformative experiences. And... I want to compare this list of features to Joseph Smith's experience. Joseph Smith experienced clarity, brightness, shining. He experienced um, making sense of things. He felt a oneness. He felt peace, inner harmony. He felt profound joy. Experienced, he experienced the good. He also experiences a change in self. He has insight and understanding. Um, and he experiences a deep at one as he feels forgiven. Um, and he also feels as though he's partic now he's now participating in his reality. He's now he has a sense that he's going to be called um, to some you know to some position of greatness. He's going to play a role in history, you know, and and he becomes the prophet of the restoration. He also describes the experience as ineffable. There are certain things that he he struggles to find the words, you know, to describe them. And all of this was preceded by. Uh, a disruptive practice or some type of psychotechnology that's meant to change your awareness, your state of consciousness. And so a lot of people might ask, or, you know, there are different versions of the first vision and, and they seem to emphasize different things and, and they seem to uh, contradict one another. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of the case, but imagine if you had such an, such a transformative experience, 
you know, and if, and if it was ineffable, how would you articulate it over time, over decades? Of course, you would, you know, as your understanding grew and grew, you would, um, you know, the details of, of the vision would, would shift. And so I believe that, you know, Joseph Smith was engaging in these practices and that he um, had a transformative experience. And as he goes on to restore the church, he restores along with it other psychotechnologies. Because one of the things that Joseph Smith does throughout his history is he tries to help others experience the same thing they experience. He puts a heavy emphasis on experiencing God for yourself. And so um, there are several articles published in Dialogue about how um, Joseph Smith, um, you know, there's a hypothesis that Joseph Smith use psychedelics to induce these types of experiences in himself and in others. Some people argue that um, the first vision was uh, induced by psychedelics. And perhaps that was the case. They don't have enough evidence to, to uh, assert that super strongly. But um, as we know, the, the, the same disruptive practices that you can engage in to change your state of consciousness can lead you to those types of mystical and transformative experiences. Um, when the temple was dedicated, um, people hypothesized that Joseph Smith used magic mushrooms in the sacrament and that induced a mass hallucination among the congregation and they reported seeing angels and heavenly beings at the dedication of the temple. That could be the case. We don't have enough evidence to, to, to claim that that's for sure the case. But, what, but the thing in common here is that their state of consciousness was definitely changed such that they had these transformative experiences. So why is any of this important? I believe that, you know, as members of the church, we're trying to seek revelation. We're trying to gain insights uh, line by line and precept by precept. And I love, I absolutely love the, the videos that the church made elder Brednar, he made them and he describes the different ways in which we receive revelation he describes it at as you know like a like a sunrise gradually rising or like a light bulb being turned on in a dark room um other apostles have made videos in which they describe um revelation coming in where they they have to carefully be in tune to the spirit kind of like when you try to manipulate a radio now in all those examples, you know, uh, you know, your state of consciousness is being changed. When you have that flash of insight, you know, at first you were frustrated with the problem, and then boom, you're, oh yeah, I have the answer. I'm, you're now excited and full of joy. Yes, this is it. Um, and so, and so, I believe that's really important for us as members of the church to engage in these practices. Um, sincerely and wholeheartedly and to do it in the right way we we tend to believe that um, we do these things as kind of like in a way to to uh, receive blessings kind of like like paying for movie tickets like if i give you money i get movie tickets well if i pray then i'll get blessings or if i fast then i'll get my answer or whatever but that's not the case we're we're not dealing in an economy of uh celestial blessing bucks um we're trying to change you know ourselves in the way that we look at the world and the way that we look at our problems and we're trying to think outside the box in such a way that we can then determine what the next step might be and i think that's you know i think that when when people describe their their um their most spiritual experiences where they have received revelation they, they tend to report, not that they know the future necessarily, but they knew what to do next. I know what to do next. I know that I need to make this decision. And so, um, and so that's what we want to do. Now, this in particular, as I was researching all this, um, this had particular interest in me because people started to, to ask me questions like, well, how did the book of Abraham come to be? Um, and uh, people have different hypotheses. And then... Um, the church released an essay in which they said the papyra 
served as a catalyst for Joseph Smith. And anti-Mormons, uh, specifically John DeLynn, who's a psychologist, well, was a psychologist, he's now a life coach, he, uh, he dismissed it completely. Oh, the, the church is, is basically saying that, um, you know, this whole thing is a made-up thing. Well, let's re-examine that now in the light of changing your state of consciousness. If you go and look at um, William James and his work on phenomenology, specifically religious phenomenology, he points out that there's the that there's a common emphasis given when we talk about spiritual experiences. He 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 says that we tend to focus on the individual having a spiritual experience within them, within the mind, and and that that experience was sort of just self-induced, and that. Um, and sometimes that's the case, but he says we don't focus enough emphasis on the environment because a lot of spiritual experiences and religious experiences are actually caused by things in our environment. So, for example, when people look out at the night sky, they might be in awe. Um, or when they climb on top of a high mountain and they feel you know, closer to heaven. Um, and that's definitely the case in scripture when people describe mountains. Um, these are all features, physical objects in the environment that affect um, your state of consciousness and how you perceive the world. And so it's not so implausible that an object like a holy relic or, uh, or, or a religious icon can inspire in someone a, a sense of awe or a sense of religious awe or they feel the spirit when they encounter a moving piece of artwork or when they hear an angelic choir. Um, for Joseph Smith, I believe that the, the papyra served as that type of catalyst. And because Joseph Smith was so familiar with these techniques, not formally, but intuitively, he was so familiar with receiving revelation and being in tune and, and praying. And, and, you know, him as a person, he was such a charismatic person. He understood how to tap into that. I don't know how he knew. He doesn't tell us how he knew. He intuitively knew how to do these things. And, and that's the case with almost all psychotechnologies. Is they're not formalized, like reading a, a manual on how to, uh, you know, use a piece of machinery. So I think it's plausible that, you know, the papyrus served as a type of catalyst for him. Um, I believe this is uh, supported by uh, the the psychological research and Joseph Smith's history on the subject, uh, you know, or his history on how he produced these works, all his works, um, the Book of Mormon, the Temple Endowment, the translations of the Bible, the Book of Enoch, and the you know, and the Book of Abraham. And so, again, this is important to me because we have serious problems that we face in life, and we need to be able to to face them somehow. And we can't, you know, we have problems that we can't simply just Google, you know, how do I interact with people who are causing me grief or, you know, how do I, um, how do I act in this given situation? There's no Google answer for that. And we have to, um, we have to pray, we have to fast and we have to engage in these practices and meditation. Um, we have to attend the temple. We have to. Um, read our scriptures. We have to sing. Lecto, Lectio Divina is where you read your scriptures out loud. And the King James Version specifically was written so you could do that, so that you could hear the word out loud. And that by hearing that word, it would change your awareness to a certain degree. And we do this so that we can gain an insight, think outside the box, and figure out what's the next step in our, in our journey. So this is my presentation. I'm now going to open it up for question and answer.